it's gonna be okay okay before we start any of this it's gonna be fine if you're like me and you invested your time and excitement into a uh, by leverkusen team who are yet to be beaten in april and are through to a cup final or still in the europa league in the quarterfinal 13 points ahead in the Bundesliga and need a maximum three more wins to win the league and might be on their way to a historic, kind of unprecedented treble. Bayern Munich have obviously done it before, but to do it over Bayern is quite something. And they're indeed very close to that. Um, so if, if you've like invested your excitement into the thought of Chami Alonso managing Liverpool then saw the news the other day that he's going to stay at Bar Leverkusen for a season and then possibly go to Real Madrid again. It's going to be okay because the next best candidate is, in my opinion, an, an okay alternative. We're going to look at him today. Uh, Ruben Amarim, of course. This is superlatives where we look at the previous month's best and worst in the Premier League and beyond. I'm doing it a little bit differently this time. It's 12.30 at night. I just had a cup of coffee like half an hour ago or maybe an hour ago. I don't know at this point. Uh, it's Ramadan. I'm staying up all night. Uh, this is one of the last 10 nights of the month, which is extra special. So I'm going to film this very, very quickly. I'm not going to lie because there are more important things to do because it is Ramadan. But let's get through this video. I, I still thought, you know, I want to talk about this. I've been very eager to, to talk about Amarim to Liverpool. I've been very eager to talk about Alexis McAllister, who is our player of the month. Uh, I'm very, very eager to talk about um, Everton, who are our disappointments of the month. And uh, yeah, very fascinated by the prospect of Ruben Amarim at Liverpool and you know, kind of what the future might hold in the next five years or so. And because of the similarities between Ruben Amarim and Chambi Alonso, at least in terms of the tactical setup on the team sheet, or not the tactical setup, let's say the formation on the team sheet, it's, it's similar. So let's go to the tactics board. It's the 3-5-2 that you see from a Leverkusen team. Amarim applies that to uh, Sporting Lisbon. And uh, it's, well, it's something that makes you think maybe a 3-5-2 is the future because you have the security of having a, a back three and two in front of them that can all have defensive responsibilities and can all kind of shut down, you know, the five lanes of the pitch. So if you think about it, half spaces are the most dangerous in football. And I've brought this up on the channel before. I spoke to a very prominent analyst in, in, in MLS, like very high up in, in a team. And what he said, which isn't a secret, I think if you're, you know, if you follow the trends of analysis and kind of um, consume that sort of content, you might know that half spaces in the area there um, let's let's highlight it in in a proper way. There we go. Whoop! It's a great website, tacticalboard.com. It's a great website. This kind of area is the most dangerous in terms of chance creation. And in Ruben Amarim's setup and his his uh, tactical plan and his utilization of the striker, this becomes very important. So. What he does, like, okay, let's let's start with the wing backs roles because in in Chabi Alonso's system, and one of the most exciting things about it is that we or was, oh, I can't get past it still. It, it was that Trent and Robertson obviously are like they they contribute immensely to the goals to output. And Frimpong and Grimaldo, no secret that they have been doing that. And uh, we we have, I, I said, TAA slash Bradley in question marks. We're going to get to that. Um, but the role of the wingbacks is very important in, in Xavi Alonso's system. Frimpong will kind of end up in, in central areas in the box, really. 
and and Grimaldo, you'll find him outside of the box getting shots away and, and scoring bangers. He's, his knuckleball might be one of the best in the world. Not might be. He, it certainly is. But the difference, the, the first kind of big difference between Alonso and Amarim is that the wingbacks really, 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 really focus on staying wide. How many times did I said really there? Probably like five. The hope from that is you stretch the opposition. You have those kind of switches of play um, into the uh, the kind of empty spaces, and then let's say Robertson on the left would would carry the ball um, all the way to the byline and maybe get himself into that half space and and provide cutbacks um, or cutbacks to the edge of the area for a number ten or whatever the case may be, but. And and another hope is that you stretch the opposition. Let's say uh, I'll put a bit of blue here. Um, that's the goalkeeper, right back, center back, and center back and left back. Okay. Without getting into debates on what shirt numbers mean, um, but the hope is that you stretch the opposition and um, kind of try to focus play on, on one side of the pitch and then you have spaces open up between the center backs or uh, between like the center back and the uh, and and the right back there and then you get the, you get runs into those empty spaces speaking of that one of the more fascinating things that Ruben Amarim does is we'll, we'll get things back in here so obviously there are two number 10s but the reason why I have Cody Gakpo there as opposed to anybody else, and I think Dominic Silbosai might be able to do that. Harvey Elliott might really suit this. In terms of the roles he played this season, I see this actually suiting Harvey Elliott more than Salah, but Salah is one of the best players to ever play the game, so we're putting him here. Uh, no, I don't mean that ironically. What happens is that they're basically inside forwards, but, but, Cody Gakpo will join in with Darwin Nunez and become a strike partner. McAllister and Salah will kind of tuck in. So that's an inside forward. This is the other inside forward. So Salah will become kind of a number 10 as well. This is a tactic I actually utilize in Football Manager in a sense, because I play like two number 10s and two strikers. Um, and it and it works, and the idea is to like congest the middle, and Sporting Lisbon do the same thing, and I feel like an absolute genius. Uh, although narrow formations work on Football Manager 2024, that's just gaming the um, the, the the match engine, and that's what I stumbled upon. I'm not any sort of technical genius in that way. It's just a video game. How whatever. Joe Gomez or whoever the central midfielder is might join to create a double pivot with Watarendo, who would be the ball-winning midfielder. So you have kind of a facilitator and a ball-winner, and then Konate and Virgil van Dijk are the two centre-backs. So you have kind of a line of two vertical lines of two, and then the wing-backs would really provide that width, and uh, the, they are the, the ones that exclusively create that sort of width. This is one way of build-up. The other being that Joe Gomez is kind of right in front of Virgil and Konate. That depends on the opposition. And then Endo and McAllister ahead of him. And then um, the striker in the middle. In that case, it's obviously going to be Darwin. And uh, Saul and, Gak and Saul and Gakpo behind him as the two number 10. So that will depend on the opposition. But the idea here is that you have a lot of players in the middle and unpredictable combinations of play that will result in um, kind of the hope there is that you displace the defenders trying to track runners and, and you don't know where they're coming from. Maybe even McAllister might be one of the ones that end up crashing into the box. So you get really quick combinations between the two number 10s and the two strikers. So McAllister to Gakpo to, to Darwin 
And every time they pass the ball and flick it around the corner, you get a, like a press there. It's beaten, and then McAllister has a run in behind, and Darwin plays it in behind, um, and then you you get a really good chance. So that's one of the like the main ways that Ruben Amarim tries to um, force his way forward, and he, it's fascinating. The there are infinite ways to play football, and there are many many beautiful ways of doing it, and the limited amount of time of watch sporting i've really enjoyed watching that specifically i've i watching portuguese football in the states is an absolute nightmare i haven't been able to do that um, but i've watched highlights and i've also watched europa league games they are out of the europa league and the weaknesses of amarim's system being that aggressive front and and, and front-footed may may have an impact because the back three, what I find from various research on different videos, some great content creators on, on YouTube have, have explained this very well. Um, Football Meta being one of them. Fantastic video. Uh, do, do go watch that if you, if you have the chance. And he really goes in, into depth about it that I won't be able to go into today. But basically, the back three are really high up, right? And are beyond midfield in, 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 in build-up. And the idea is to push the opposition back as much as possible or to try to beat their, their, their press high up in or at the same time having the close proximity to the, the central midfielders and the number 10s to be able to play passes into them. And then you get those uh, really quick combinations. Um the problem now is that if you have let's say uh, i'll put the winger here number number eight here okay the number eight let's say if you have a number eight that intercepts like virgil tries to pass it into mccallister and then you get the pass cut out here then there's all the space in behind if a, if a good ball is played in behind that you know if they're straight the wrong goal and there if there's not enough coverage at the back then it's a big problem, and that's one of the ways that they lost to At uh, Atalanta away is from that, is from giving the ball away really high up the pitch and uh, that being intercepted and, and, turned, and turned into an immediate chance that they, that they scored from. That's the big concern. The other big concern being that the wingbacks are so aggressively attacking, they're in line with Gukaris, really, that you don't really get any defensive support from them. You know, sporting are front-footed and attacking and try to, to like pass their way through and therefore will have a lot of possession. And um, actually, their pressing stats are similar to Liverpool and Leverkusen. If they lose it, they try to win it quickly. And so you don't get defenders dropping back and therefore you get exposed Alisson being in goal, being one of the better sweeper keepers in the world, and the current center backs, Virgil, Gomez, Canate, and Kwanza, Kwanza being quietly so, it's very, very, very quick, which can mitigate for that. And the technical quality of Liverpool players, as opposed, I'm guessing, Liverpool players are better than sporting players, and therefore the chance of giving the ball away in that way is kind of smaller compared to sporting, but also sporting play in a less standard of competition than in the Premier League in terms of like quality-wise. So maybe that also means that the same weaknesses exist. Um, but like from kind of from my research uh, and from kind of the footage that I've seen, this is my main concern about Ruben Amarim managing at, at Liverpool. But the football that they play is beautiful uh, and is really fun to watch and the kind of clogging up the middle and getting those really rapid, high-tempo passing sequences is really beautiful. One more thing to add tactically, uh, and I've been recording for 16 minutes, my goodness, is that Darwin Nunez is very similar to Victor Gutierrez, who... His heat map looks amazing because he's all over the final third. He will run everywhere. He'll try to run 
into those half spaces, getting himself in here. He's contributed ten assists in the league. A lot of them from cutbacks because you get them, you you get him by the byline here, and then you get a run from from a Gakpo or from a, a Salah, let's say, and the the cutback is is kind of set up really well for it to happen. Darwin Nunez has the engine to do those same kinds of runs, and he has done it um, in, in, in the league this season. It's contributed in goal scoring that way is because he makes him, he runs about, and he has the recognition and the flexibility to support his, um, to, to make those supporting runs. Sometimes he'll swap positions with Salah to, to the right. Sometimes he'll swap positions with Gakpo on the left, and that has been a, an explicit tactic at times when you have three forwards and they kind of switch positions uh, at unpredictable times, and that has given Liverpool a lot of goals. One more thing I, I feel like this, or one more effect I feel like this will have is McAllister really come into his own uh, as someone who has played double pivot and has a, won a World Cup playing double pivot and has impressed, obviously, the, the Brighton team that uh, got the Europa League with Caicedo and McAllister. That was a really good version of McAllister too. The, ultimately, the version that won the World Cup and got the transfer to Liverpool with his defensive qualities too, having played as a single pivot uh, a, a lot of times with, with Liverpool and put up kind of the same defensive numbers. And defensive numbers are kind of a scam, but you get what I mean but the same defensive effort uh, been as defensively active as he has been when he's played as an eight or a box to box or a playmaker, whatever you want to call it. Um, I think that role next to next to Endo, just to bring it back into shape a little bit here, it will suit him. Um, and I really look forward to his role within that team, provided that Amory goes to Liverpool Okay, enough about Liverpool. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And I think if and when Amarim goes to Liverpool, we should be optimistic. Um, because there's a really high level of technical quality at Liverpool. Question marks about the kind of involvement of certain players. Trent will have to go back to kind of the 2018 version that hugged the, the, the touchline and spammed crosses in, having been so used to tucking inside next to McAllister at times and uh, being just sort of a playmaker and playing in like a, sim a single pivot with England at, at times too. I wonder if Connor Bradley is someone that will, uh, that will fit the role better at this point. Obviously, probably Trent is going to be still the, the starting wing back, but I'm curious about the change there, uh, the, the switch back. Or is, like, is Trent used to his role now, or has he become so versatile, which is my hope and my expectation, he's become so versatile, or has he become more versatile um, than before that he's able to just switch back into the 2018, 2019 form of, of Trent and being wide? Uh, Luis Diaz, where does he fit in this? Is he, he's the sort of player that kind of stays wide, keeps the width, takes on his right back to an elite level. I think Luis Diaz is the sort of player you want you to build your team around because you will not have a player anywhere in the world that gets you from one end of the pitch to the other as effectively as Luis Diaz. He's one of the best ball-carrying players in the whole world. And this is a privilege. Okay, enough about Ruben Amri. <laughs> let's, uh, we've, we've talked about this for 20 minutes. So let's go to uh, the Premier League table. Um, oh, look at that. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Liverpool having lost one game back in February, drawn one to Man City scandal at the end of the game it should have been a penalty but it's okay because Arsenal and Man City stunk the gaff up with this, this horrific performance from both sides 
Arsenal let a, a Premier League title slip off the grasp, and I won't shut up about this. If Liverpool win the league, it's Arsenal's fault for 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 that draw against Man City. And I, the thing that confuses me as well is why were they so happy with the draw when they knew that this meant that they dropped off the top? It's crazy to me. It's absolutely crazy to me. But Everton, um. I am someone who doesn't like Everton Football Club very much. And or and normally seeing this would make me laugh. But I have a very good friend. His name is Reese. Um he's he's from Wales. I haven't ever met him in person. I'm lucky enough to have a a, a large group of, of of friends that I've made over COVID and the preceding years or the following years um, from, from Discord communities and um, from just content creation and different things like that. And Reese happens to be a Welsh Everton fan. And he's had a stinking 2024 so far. And I'm just, I'm just so, I feel so sorry for him every time something bad happens to Everton. Uh, whether it's another point deduction or another rumor of a point deduction or that line that this is the stinkiest form in Everton history. And it's just sad. It's just really, 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 really sad. And I'm, I'm, it, it doesn't become funny anymore. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, it's awful. And they have Burnley next, which is, nine hours from now so by the time this video goes up we may know if ever the the everton burnley result already if they lose that i mean come on another like close disappointment of the month is luton town because like come on this is also this isn't great either like losing to sheffield united at home at, on on february 10th this was a really massive game that they uh, that they kind of lost, and they've been giving like a good account of themselves at times this season, of course. But form as of late, they've had really tough fixtures, but form hasn't been great. But Everton are going through their worst ever period in the Premier League. Oh, Player of the Month, hmm, Alexis McAllister. Alexis McAllister, what a guy. What a player. You see his goal against Sheffield United, and that's not even his best goal this season. Um, here is a stat that tells you it, it, the it, goal contributions as of late. Having him play as a playmaker and having Guattara endo fit is such a, a blessing. It's so good. It's so good. The, the amount of privilege of having seen Alexis Picasso actually play live last month uh, in, in Philly is, uh, is really cool. I spoke about it in the last uh, podcast episode. You should watch it. It's really, really cool. And then the non-Premier League player of the month is Florian Wirtz. Just because, well, he plays for Bayer Leverkusen. It's been another imperious month. He's one of the main contributions. But his goal against France, I know I'm cheating a little bit, but his goal against France is, is quite something. Seven seconds in, and he gets the ball 25 yards out and then whips it. That was one of the goals of the month for me. And it, it reinforced my absolute admiration for Florian Wirtz. Uh, so we'll give him the non-Premier League player of the month. And that will be all. It's 1 a.m. Um, I'm going to go do Ramadan things. Uh, I hope you're well. We'll see you again after Liverpool play Man United at Old Trafford again. Which is always a fixture that fills me with dread. We still, we're still yet to play actually said Everton. But as I said, it, it's, it's, it's going to be okay. Okay? It's going to be fine. Even if we don't win the league. At least we always had Jurgen.